because that is, it, at its heart is a behavior therapy, we're really thinking about our own stimulus function in the room. What are we evoking or eliciting? Um, the difference between eliciting and evoking is really if it's classical or operant conditioning, which 50 years ago behaviorists would really argue about. No one really cares these days. So the important thing is just to, to consider you're having an effect on your client just by showing up. Um, what is, does, it, uh, does it evoke a certain behavior? If you're late, if you appear to shovel, if you, if you seem overly tired, um, is there a behavioral response to your gender, your physical appearance, your attire? Um, I've had colleagues where uh, we've realized in consulting on cases that you know, Tian and I may um, conceptualize a client in exactly the same way, but it would mean something very different for a client if, um, if both of us were to either be very assertive and really push you know, no, I'm worried about you when you do this. I'm wanting to ask, you know, it would be important to me. If you wouldn't try this, Tian could get away with that. I'd probably seem overly aggressive. And if Tian tried my, like, teddy bear, teddy bear style at the back, it would probably all be completely too soft and no longer uh, feel authentic and reinforcing. And we also want to consecrate client behavior. So, like most contemporary behavior therapies, uh, we don't put a lot of emphasis on the idea of punishment. We know that that's not nearly as good of a uh, way of shaping or modifying behavior as reinforcement is. But we might still consider how to block a behavior. So, um, oh, let's see. Uh, in the example I gave before of the person who was always saying, I felt this way at the end of the day, as depressed people do, or, well, I'm a depressed person, so obviously when this happened at work, I felt this way. Do you think that that makes other people feel closer or further away from him? If you, if you had the knowledge that he also spoke like this in his day-to-day -day life. And further away. So, so how would you block this in the session? So some ideas could be, um, it felt distancing to me when you said it this way. Would you be willing to retell me what happened without describing the clinical language? Um, would it, um, uh, you could try uh, softer if you're newer to a client and you're gauging their capacity for blocking, simply, um, uh, reflecting the emotions and asking more about those. So we want to, we'll get into more examples, um, but really the functions will have their strongest effect on in-session behavior. Uh, the idea in fact is not that we're focusing on homework. If you go back a few decades, CBT protocols for interpersonal difficulties are all just kind of, here's, we're gonna talk through at a meta level, and then here's a worksheet of how to talk through or, you know, or go over your dear man points in your DBT group or something like that, which can be helpful, but you also have someone in the room responding to them. Are you responding to your client's request? When your client makes an, a request like, could you meet me at this time that you're usually not in your office? Or could you call my psychiatrist for me because they're not listening to me? You want to hold space for the idea that this has a very different uh, reinforcement history for all of them. Is this a client where um, there's profound difficulty in expressing a need? And you might uh, feel this is a, a, a wonderful opportunity to reinforce that, even if it's something you wouldn't typically do? Or is this someone who is routinely violating or crossing their personal boundaries, where it would feel important to say no? So there are only a few kind of jargon pieces to FAP that are important for conceptualization. Uh, the, the most common language you'll come across in articles or reading that's helpful is the reference to a CRB1 or a CRB2. The CRB just stands for clinically relevant behavior. So our first task 
is always in beginning to attempt to differentiate for this specific client in front of me in this specific moment, is this a clinically relevant behavior? Um, like I just said, the example of someone asking to meet an atypical, at an atypical time who routinely avoids asking for their needs to be met, it's a very different function, or, or that behavior serves a very different function than the person who routinely violates boundaries. So, you, so, so the, um, the, this primary shorthand of just beginning to think about the, the classes of your client's behavior in terms of is this an improvement or is this um, a signifier of a problem behavior. Um, there are some approaches to, to FAP that really emphasize the idea of um, uh, just closeness or further away in the relationship, which could be a good shorthand, um, though you'll probably have more effect on your client in their life if you're thinking more broadly about if it's a problem behavior or if it's a behavior that expresses improvement and in the room so we can work on them on the spot. Um, FAP is not a therapy that really emphasizes the idea of like hashing through um, past events or events of your week unless it's serving a purpose that we can tie to in the moment behavior. So for example, over today and tomorrow we'll do exercises that involve looking at your past, looking at your history, but it's based on the idea that there is affect that's linked to that that may or may not be difficult right here in this moment to convey. Um, that there are probably topics or emotional states that are difficult to, um, to experience or sit with in a professional space. So even though we talk about the past, the content is not actually what we're working with in fact. The content could be anything. Is this all old hat so far?